Good morning, church. I'm Adam. Thanks for joining us in our virtual church lobby right here on Church Online. Over the next 30 minutes, our host and pastoral team will be engaging with you on some key events that are coming up in the life of our church, how your week has been going, as well as joining you in prayer. If you're currently watching on our YouTube page, we'd love for you to come and join us in our virtual church lobby by visiting our church website and clicking the Join Us button. Yes, it's that simple for us to come together as one global church family today. Now, let's continue to connect virtually by answering this question. What emoji best describes the week that you just had?
Hey church, we hope you got the chance to say hello to someone you know this morning. And if you are new with us, we hope that you got the chance to meet some truly awesome people. Now, as we get ready to enter into our live stream service, we would just like to remind you of a few things. If you're currently watching on YouTube and would like to engage in our chat, as well as our post-service prayer time, you can do so by visiting our church website and simply clicking the Join Us button. Secondly, our pastoral team will be in the chat for 30 minutes after service to engage with you further about today's message, any questions that you may have, as well as an extended time of prayer. Simply click the Request Prayer button to connect with someone today. Church, let's quiet our hearts as we focus in together on the Word of God through our songs of worship and a message from Pastor Brett. We will see you again in the chat room after service today.
welcome to our online worship experience. If you were a part of the virtual church lobby this morning, click on one of those buttons in the chat to help us say thank you to our chat host and pastoral team this morning. Our prayer is that you would feel encouraged, loved, and seen this morning as we come together online as one global church family to worship and listen to the Word of God. Thank you for taking the time out of your week to be here with us today. Okay, Church, some exciting news that we want to share with you. Our annual DNA Global Mission Conference. We're excited to let you know that DNA 2021 is happening, and it's happening online from May 30 to June 13. We'll be hearing from special guest speakers as well as our missionaries serving in communities all around the world. So mark your calendars and get ready to be inspired and challenged for God's global mission. We hope that over these upcoming weeks, we'll all be challenged to see differently. Visit the church website for conference details. At the end of the service today, our virtual church lobby will stay open for 30 minutes for you to engage further with today's message and for an extended time of prayer with our pastoral team. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you so much for bringing us together so that we can worship you and we can fellowship together in this virtual mode. We ask you to open our ears to hear and our hearts to accept today's message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, before we join our voices in songs of praise, let's take a sneak peek at what's coming up at DNA 2021. I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus. And your love for God's people everywhere. I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. We pray that the eyes of our hearts will be opened so that we can know the hope of our calling as His holy people. Good morning, my name is Rebecca and I'm here at the People's Church to celebrate with you, to worship with you and to learn. I don't know about you, but this continues to be uh, different, difficult times and things are changing for everybody. Um, but one thing that never changes is that we are children of God. All we have to do is ask him and receive his love. And he calls us his child. And I sometimes uh, you know, just have to remind myself, I have to sit in peace and just receive God's love and remind myself, yes, I am loved by the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. So I hope that you can do that right now as well. Just let go, give to him any burdens, anything you're thinking about um, that's weighing you down. It doesn't matter where you are or who you're with. So let's just commit this time to God and celebrate. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you died for us. And thank you that you conquered the grave. Lord, I'm not perfect. I'm so far from it. And Lord, thank you that you remind me that I am yours. Father, I pray for all those right now who are at home, wherever they are. God, I thank you that we are still a community. We are a church and that God, we can raise one voice to sing your praise. In your heavenly name we pray, amen. Feel free to stand up where you are if you're comfortable.
and how we want to let him work through us. Reflect on those words and sing it directly to God as a prayer. is a day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it we thank God for his goodness our world has been turned upside down but we are confident in this that we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living what a joy to be able to get together and worship the Lord 
through our global church family from different locations. It is a blessing. And if you're joining us for the first time, my name is Solange. We welcome you at the People's Church. Let us know in the chat where you're joining us for and how we can support you. And you're part of, if you're part of the TPC Church family, we miss seeing you in person, but we're glad that you're connecting online with us. Keep connecting online. Check out the website to see how you could connect throughout the week through the different activities that are happening. If you or someone that you know needs care, feel free to call the church. Send us an email at care at the People's Church. Giving is another way that we worship the Lord to, as an act of obedience and an act of love. We give so that we can partner with our, our global partners to help people experience Christ and grow in the knowledge of Christ. But also, we give to help with the needs, wherever the need is. And as a first response to crisis, we pray and we act. We pray because we know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to His power working within us. So we act. And as a church, we've been praying for the people of India and the island of St. Vincent, who are currently in crisis. We're working with our local partners to support them as they try to help the most vulnerable that are in crisis. So if you want to find out how to pray or how to support the, our efforts in St. Vincent and in India, we invite you to check the church crisis response page on the church website. So as you bring your tithes, offering, and faith promise today, there's several ways you can give. You can text a message, People's Give at 77977. You can also click on the Give button on the chat, or you can visit the church website to find other ways in which you can give. So church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are faithful, that you never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, Father God, for the Holy Spirit that is working within us to be able to help us to connect outside of the four walls of our church building. We thank you, Father, that you have been good to us. You have blessed us. You have provided for us. We thank you that you've answered prayers. And as we've been praying for the people of India, we thank you that the case, cases have been going down. We thank you, Father, that 500 ventilators have made their way from Ontario to India. We are thankful for it. We thank you, Father, for the efforts in the island of St. Vincent. And we pray for our partners as, as they seek for ways to optimize the resources so that they can meet the needs of people as they're working to reconstructing their communities. We thank you for your grace will be sufficient for them. Your strength is made perfect when we're weak. Father God, we thank you. We pray for the body of Christ at the People's Church that the heart of our mind will be open. We thank you, Father God, that you will give us a spirit of wisdom and understanding the knowledge of you, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that we may know the hope that we have in you so that we may know we have a purpose in you, Father. We thank you today that you'll continue to order our steps in your will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's open our hearts right now as we welcome Pastor Brett, who is continuing his message through the song. Hey, good morning, church. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Psalm 32. We're going to be looking there in a moment. It is great to be in this live online environment. As we get ready here at the church, sometimes I pop into the lobby and I see the chat going on, and it just gives a greater sense of connection when we're all worshiping together at the same time. So I'm excited that we get to do this together. This is going to be our last message in the Psalms series, but we contained most of our messages in this first run into book one. There's five books uh, throughout the books of Psalms. It's been broken into five sections. And so 
In future months, years, Lord willing, we'll dive into those other books and revisit this. But for those of you who want to take a deeper dive, as I was preparing and studying for our psalm series, I picked up a book by Eugene P Peterson entitled Answering God, and it's just an overview of the book of Psalms. It gives you some wisdom as you approach it, how to approach uh, this book of prayer. And it is a fantastic book. I would highly recommend it to you. It's now in my top five best books of all time. And it's a book you can read over and over again. I found it immensely helpful. I'm sure you can pick it up at Amazon or any book outlet. Answering God by Eugene Peterson. Now, there is one main point to my message this morning out of Psalm 32, and I actually lifted it out of the text and made it my title. My message this week is this, do not be like the mule. Do not be like the mule. Let's dive in and see what David means. David opens with tremendous wisdom and blessing. He's at a high point. In verse one, we read this, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Psalm 32 again taps into the deepest longing of man, the quest for happiness and blessing. And that word blessed is the same word that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the same word that the Psalms opens with in Psalm 1. And it means supremely blessed and happy. Now, it's not something we simply get, but something we are in the process of becoming. It's a state of being. It's not a material possession, but more of a becoming. And David's blessedness is centered on the cleansing and forgiveness that he's experiencing before his God. David, in the first verses, is emphasizing the totality of the forgiveness that he has experienced. He's not pretending that his sins never happened because he speaks to them and affirms their existence, but the reality that the Lord has granted him a total pardon. David uses three words for sin, and we looked at this a few weeks ago in our psalm series, that there's primarily three Hebrew words in the Old Testament to describe sin. There's the common one that we're familiar with, simply translated sin, and that speaks to missing the mark. Then there's something a little more serious that's referred to in the scriptures as iniquities. And the second time that sin is used in those first two verses, it would be better translated iniquity. And iniquity is when you drive off the road into the ditch in your life. And then there was the mother of all sins, the, the transgressions. This was like you're driving down the road the wrong way. This is open rebellion towards God. And David speaks to all three in the first two verses, but he's emphasizing the pardon that he's received from God. Transgressions forgiven, sins covered, iniquities, the Lord doesn't count them against me. David adds an interesting statement at the conclusion of verse two. Blessed is the one in whose spirit there is no deceit. David's referring to the genuineness of his repentance. He's not taking a casual approach to grace, but a sincere longing for his forgiveness, not simply going through the motions of worship, but a genuine confession. He's not trying to hide anything, but is laid open and bare before the Lord. You know, it's like when you confront your children about their sin, when you start to discipline them, and sometimes they throw out to you just a casual, like, okay, I'm sorry, but you know they don't really mean it. What David is emphasizing here is that God's word has penetrated his life, and there is a genuineness to his repentance. But then in verse 3, David goes into a bit of the backstory and shares a testimony of the pathway to this blessed state. Look at what he says in verse 3. When I kept silent, 
My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. You know, I think we can all remember what verse 3 and 4 feel like when we sin and we try to cover it up as early as our young childhood years. We know what that feels like. When mom walks into the room and there's crayon on the wall and you're holding a crayon in your hand and you hear her walking up the steps and you hide it behind your back and when she walks in and you and your brother are there and and she sees the writing on the wall, you pretend like it wasn't you. You might rat out your younger brother because he seems a little more defenseless and as your mom begins to interrogate what happened, you start to feel that burning within you as you're trying to cover up your iniquity, your transgression, your sin. We all know what that feels like. I remember a few years ago, I read the book Crime and Punishment written by the novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky. And it's a brilliant book that highlights how we don't really get away with sin even when we try. The main character's name is Raskolnikov, and he plots out and premeditates a crime that he's going to commit. He methodically plans it out for weeks prior to it taking place where he's going to rob a pawnbroker, and he justifies that nobody likes her, and so it's okay for him to do this. And he goes through the motions in his mind as he premeditates what he's going to do. And the book details how he commits the crime. He ends up murdering two individuals, but he gets away with it and seemingly gets away scot-free. But this is what's so masterful about the book and what it unpacks, is that you may get away with committing a transgression, but you can't get away from your conscience. The longer that Raskolnikov keeps silent about his crime, whenever he runs into the police or other individuals, he is overwhelmed with searing hot pain. His bones start to waste away. He's groaning all day long. He's experiencing all the symptoms that David describes because, yes, you can get away with the original act, but oftentimes it's the cover-up that causes so much pain. Now, it's a little interesting that the main character's name of the book, Raskolnikov, literally means schism or split. And it's fitting because that's what secret sin grows into. A split where your mind is working hard to cover up your guilt. It's dizzying, trying to keep track of all the lies that you've told, having to cover your tracks your body starts to manifest physical symptoms the longer you try and cover up your iniquity. What the book so accurately reflects is, yes, you can get away with a sin, but you can't get away from God or your conscience. And your silence will take a toll on your body. You notice in those verses that David's cover-up takes a toll on him physically, psychologically, and spiritually. Physically, he says, my bones wasted away, groaning all day long. My strength is sapped as in the heat of summer. Psychologically, David is troubled in his mind. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. The Hebrew word for hand there is used oftentimes to denote the strength or power of a father's hand upon his child. It reminded me this week as I was studying that word of when I was a child, we would take long trips in the car to different destinations, and it would probably take two days of driving to get there. And my brother and I would be sitting in the back seat, and I remember that on these long trips, sometimes we would become irritated My brother was much larger than me, took up more of the back seat than me, and we would inevitably get into fights with one another. And my dad would be driving down the road, and when he had had it, I mean, we had tested and and kind of put our fingers on his last nerve, he would lose his temper, and then he would reach back with his hand, and he would grab one of our legs and squeeze it really hard. His heavy hand was upon us. We used to have a name for it growing up. We called it the claw. 
And we would be misbehaving in the backseat, causing all kinds of distraction. And all of a sudden, the claw would start to reach back. And man, when that claw came back, we would hightail it into the rear view window. I mean, I don't even know the physics of how that all works. I would still have my seat belt, seat belt buckled in, but somehow I would climb into the rear view window of the car to get away from the claw. People behind us must have been like, what is wrong with this family? How is that child in the back window? I can see a seat belt. The physics don't even make sense. My dad's driving down the highway at 65 miles an hour, reaching back with the claw. So when David talks about God's heavy hand upon him, he's talking about the reality that God has laid hold of him and won't let him go. All of these were simply symptoms of the real problem plaguing him. It was a spiritual problem that was manifesting physical symptoms. It was his sin his desire to cover up his iniquity, his refusal to acknowledge his transgressions to the Lord. Now, when you study the Old Testament law, and especially the book of Leviticus, what's interesting to note when you study Leviticus is that there was no animal sacrifice for intentional sin. Whenever the book of Leviticus speaks of sin, it speaks of those who have committed sin unintentionally. When you sinned intentionally, there was nothing that you could bring. Nothing you could offer, no clear path to restitution or reconciliation. There was nothing that you could do. Why? Why did God write the book of Leviticus that way? Certainly God must have known that there would be times where we would sin intentionally. I believe God did this to reveal to his people the totality of their condition and the totality of his mercy. The reality is that we're completely dependent upon his grace for our need. And David, after resisting God, after remaining silent, after trying to cover everything up, after who knows how many days, weeks, maybe even months of symptoms plaguing him, acknowledges and carries out a threefold confession before the Lord. He says, I acknowledged my sin. I didn't cover up my iniquity. I confessed my transgression. And then he adds this line, you forgave the guilt of my sin. David brings an offering of confession and open and honest laying out of his rebellion before his God. And upon his confession, he not only finds total forgiveness, but also relief. We can assume that his strength returns, the groaning resides, the heavy hand is removed. David experiences relief spiritually, psychologically, and physically. He experiences the blessedness that he speaks of in verse 1, supreme happiness welling up within his soul. But he doesn't just experience relief. David's experience goes much further than that. David then shifts gears into the deeper gift of God that we're invited into when he says the word therefore in verse 6. That is a linchpin in the text. He's saying, in light of God's mercy, therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. David is saying to break the cycle of sin and dodging God and his heavy hand upon you, the cycle that we see in verses 3 through 5, let all the faithful cry out to you. Let them pray to you. Let them seek you. And David then speaks to the deliverance that we're invited into. In verse 7, he says this, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. 
And then God breaks into the psalm. God breaks into the prayer and shows up in this psalm. And God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. David displays the relationship that we're invited into. You are my hiding place, my protector, my deliverer. And God speaks back. I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do you remember when you were growing up as a child, you used to play hide and seek? And when you're young as a child, sometimes you don't pick the best hiding spots. I remember playing with my boys when they were really young, ages two and three, and they would hide in the living room, but they would hide in such a way where you could almost see them in plain sight. See, as a child, sometimes you think that if you can't see the father, the father can't see you. And so my kids would hide behind the curtain, but you would stare at the wall, it would be flat, and then there's this huge uh, dent in the curtain with some feet sticking out. What David is saying to us in this text is that make God your hiding place. He's a really big God and can cover you completely. It's a good spot, and he will protect you from calamity. What David is saying is that as we make our refuge in him, he instructs us. As we abide in him, he abides in us and is at work in us, counseling us, teaching us, guiding us. David's making an important point. God isn't simply the forgiver of our sins. He is also our deliverance from a life of sin. Look at what he says in the text. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach me. You will protect me from trouble. You will surround me with songs of deliverance. As we make our home in him, his deliverance becomes our experience. But then David warns against a potential trap in the life of God's people. Look at what he says in verse 9. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. David says, don't be like a donkey. Don't be like a mule. Don't be stubborn. Don't make it that God has to drag you to himself. But let me get a bit deeper into what David's really saying, I think, and what the scripture is calling us to, because the New Testament also speaks to this. And I'm going to do it with a more common animal that we're familiar with, because not many of us have a mule in our backyard in the city of Toronto. I'm going to show you a picture of my dog. I've shown you this before. This is our dog, Cody. Now, this picture was taken one day when I was doing my devotional and I went to refill my coffee and he jumped up into my spot and he's reading the scriptures. I mean, this dog is spiritual. He's doing his daily devotions. But let me say this. Don't be deceived by the cute exterior. This dog is a sinner. This dog is disgusting. It is a filthy animal. Don't ever let a dog lick your face. You have no idea what that dog is doing in between moments that it's looking cute on your couch. My dog will eat anything that falls from the table, but even worse, we have a lot of rabbits in our neighborhood, and in our backyard, sometimes those rabbits go to the washroom and leave some pebbles behind. My dog will go into the backyard, he will sniff around, and he will eat another animal's poop. And it makes him sick. He comes in, he will throw this up on the carpet inside the house, and while you're going to get some paper towel to clean up his vomit, by the time you've returned, he's eaten his own vomit. This dog is disgusting. 
Sometimes when I'm walking him through the neighborhood, he will see other dogs that are huge, much larger than he is, who could eat him like an appetizer for lunch, and he will bark at them like he's a fierce wolf or something like that. He will lose his mind. You see, my dog has no understanding. He must be controlled by leash and collar. And this is what I think David in Scripture is saying to us. Let me ask you today who are watching this. Are you experiencing the deliverance version of Christianity that David describes? Or the dog version of Christianity? Do you make it a priority to make him your hiding place? Do you hide in the shadow of his wings? Does he instruct you? Do you sit long enough to hear his voice as you study the scriptures? Do you give him enough time to teach you in the way you should go? Or do you simply sit like a dog, receive your treat, and then run back to your vomit? You see, some people stop at verses 3 through 5 and fail to move into verses 6 through 9. They practice confession, but they fail to practice understanding. We are not meant to make our home in the same sins and transgressions endlessly. We're not meant to come before him and throw them up in confession only to return back to the very things that we just threw up in confession. We're meant to make him our hiding place, a place filled with songs of deliverance, a place of instruction and teaching, a place of counsel under his loving and watchful eye. Verse 9 is meant to convey that God doesn't want to have to drag you to come to him. He doesn't want to have to sap your strength or cause you to groan or have his heavy hand upon you. He doesn't want to have to put bit or bridle into your mouth to lead you, but he will if he has to. The discipline of God isn't meant to shame you. It's actually meant to set you free. He wants you to come to him willingly and joyfully. And so let me ask you this morning, what version of Christianity are you experiencing? Is it simply confession and forgiveness on repeat? Or are songs of deliverance surrounding you? Because you see, this can creep into the life of the New Testament believer as well. Peter warns the church about this very reality in the life of a believer in his second letter to the church, 2 Peter. In his letter to the church, he warns about false teachers and their destruction who have infiltrated the church, and he warns against the deception of a watered-down version of Christianity that consists primarily of comfort, convenience, and cheap grace. And he describes the end state of the carnal church attender, the person that's simply going through the motions. And here's what Peter says of the carnal church attender. He says this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Peter's writing to People who are inside the church, they're not outside the church, they're inside the church. And they were people who were leading others astray. They promised them deliverance, but they themselves were slaves of depravity. They would twist and contort the scriptures to their desires, bringing their own destruction. They would wander away from the gospel of Jesus Christ and lead people to a cheap grace that enabled their own appetites. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter encourages the church. He tells them to dive into the scriptures to make every effort to grow in their faith, to add to their knowledge, their self-control, perseverance, to grow in maturity and love so that their Christian life will be effective and productive. It's a great letter to read this week in your devotionals. But it begs the question for us, 
Do we make every effort to grow our faith, to grow our knowledge, our self-control, our godliness, our understanding? Do we make him our hiding place? Or does our effort get spent on other things? What Psalm 32 is reminding us is that we're invited into deliverance and not bound to a life of disobedience. Jesus didn't set you free from sin so that you could go back to wallowing in the mud or eating your own vomit, eating the contents of your own confession over and over and over again. He sets you free so that you can experience a life of deliverance, a life of him being your hiding place, your refuge, your strong tower, a life animated by his spirit at work within you, his power, his strength as you make every effort to abide in him. You see, too many people settle for a complacent Christianity or a compromised version of Christianity. Some people in the church don't even know Christ at all, even though they're going through the motions of attending church. Jesus warns about this in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And he goes on to say that many will say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not drive out demons and in your name perform, perform many miracles? And he says to them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You know, the sobering thing in that text is that they know the Lord. They use his name. But his reply to them is that I never knew you. Oh, yes, you knew me, but I didn't know you. Jesus goes on to say that everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You see, we're not to meant to just hear the words of God or quote them. We're meant to put them into practice. When Jesus gives the disciples the Great Commission, he says to them, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Not simply teaching them to know or to believe the right things, but that their lives would conform to his ways. What David's talking about here is that the blessed person doesn't stop and camp at verses 3 through 5 and simply confess and repeat the same sins. But they're welcomed into a relationship of deliverance described in verses 6 through 9 where God becomes our hiding place, our protector, our teacher, leading us with his presence and our lives increasingly reflecting his ways. David closes the psalm by describing the two paths of how this can play out in our lives. Look at what he says in verse 10. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unloving, unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. You know, again, what David is saying is when we're like a mule, uncontrollable and unlearning, it only leads to woe. Sin, transgressions, and iniquity lead to misery. It leads to the discomfort of verses 3 and 4, where we're groaning all day long over our disobedience. Our strength is sapped. God's heavy hand is upon us. Dear Christian brother or sister, that is not what your life is meant to be about. That's why when you sin... You're miserable. Sin is incompatible with the believer. You have been transformed into a new creation. You actually don't like sinning because when you do, it creates misery within you. It creates groaning. It saps your strength. His disciplinary hand comes upon you. And if you're in that place today, then for goodness sake, acknowledge your transgression. Don't try and cover up your iniquity. Confess your sin because we're reminded that when we come to him with open, honest 
confession. He forgives our sin, not because of what we have done, but because of who he is and what he has done. You remember in the Old Testament, there was no offering for intentional sin. But when you get to the New Testament, you discover that there is a place where your sin can be forgiven. Your iniquities not counted against you, but they are counted against someone. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross secured our salvation from sin. It paid the price. It covered the guilt. It was on him that the sin of mankind was laid and the wrath of God was poured out. And we're told in Scripture that there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, and that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you're in that place today where you're wrapped up and held by sin, open your life before him, confess your guilt, confess your rebellion, because he is faithful and just to forgive. But the good news of the gospel is that he doesn't simply leave you there. He doesn't leave you in verses 3 through 5, confession and forgiveness on repeat. We're told in the New Testament that when we call on his name, he clothes us with himself. We become members of his very body, not so that we can live as stubborn mules or dogs that return to their vomit, We move into the goodness of deliverance. The Lord's unfailing love surrounds those who trust in him. We are saved from sin in order to be surrounded by songs of deliverance. That's the good news of the gospel. And David caught up with this, admonishes the believers in verse 11. He says this, rejoice in the Lord and be glad. You righteous, sing, all you who are upright in heart. David closes giving us three instructions. Rejoice, be glad, and sing. Worship your Savior. You see, the songs of deliverance that we're surrounded by become the songs of deliverance in our worship music. What Psalm 32 reminds us of is that we can experience total forgiveness, total deliverance, and add total worship, our whole lives complete coming before him. That is the state of the believer. What an amazing God and Savior we serve. Let's pray. Father, our hearts are simply full of who you are, And Lord, we come before you acknowledging our sin, our iniquity, our transgression, our rebellion. And we thank you for this blessed state that we can experience, that our iniquity doesn't count against us, but you did account for it against Christ on the cross. But thank you that through his death, burial, and resurrection, We are invited into the deliverance of Christ, into victorious living over sin, not because of who we are, but because of the power of your Holy Spirit at work within us. Lord, thank you for that good news, and may we walk in the goodness of that this week. May you be our hiding place, our protector, our deliverer, the one who instructs us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, church. Live in the good of that truth this week. God bless. Thanks for worshiping with us today, church. It is so great to learn, grow, and encourage one another each week. Church, we look forward to worshiping with you again next week, right here, as we gather as one church. Remember, Sundays begin at 10 a.m. with our kids' Zoom gatherings followed by our virtual lobby at 10.30, leading into our online service at 11. Next week, we'll be taking communion together. That's right, next week. 
We ask that you prepare your communion elements before joining our online worship service. But just in case you forget, our online host will be sure to remind you next week when you log in and say hello. If you'd like to study in a group setting, we encourage you to join one of our online life groups. Our life groups are where we get to gather in a smaller group during the week to encourage one another and grow together in our faith journey. You can learn more and sign up by visiting our website, thepeopleschurch.ca. See you next week, Church.